This is a special edition of the Imperial College podcast. Science, engineering, medicine, medicine chemistry, physics, biology, humanities, cardiology, cardiology computer, public health, global science, And I'm Gareth Mitchell. Today, a whole edition devoted to this year's three Nobel Prizes for Science. We're taking a close look at the awards for chemistry, physiology or medicine, and, of course, physics. I'm delighted that the Nobel Committee has decided to recognise this particular discovery. There's no doubt that the discovery of the Higgs boson is a major event in uh, particle physics. As you are probably aware, I was to some extent involved in this. Classic, modest understatement there from Imperial Emeritus Professor Tom Kibble speaking on the day that the Physics Prize was announced. More comments from him as we go along and we have analysis of all the prizes from our researchers here at Imperial. Right, so let's start with the Physics Nobel Prize. And in fact, I've made it away from the studio across campus to meet uh, Jerome Gauntlet, who's head of the theoretical physics group in the physics department. So the Nobel has finally gone, I suppose not surprisingly, to the discovery of the Higgs boson and the people behind it, of course. Yes, it was uh, a wonderful announcement building on this marvellous work that was done almost 50 years ago, confirming the visionary ideas of Francois Anglais, uh, Peter Higgs, who first posited the idea of the Higgs field, which eventually led to the prediction of the Higgs boson that was measured at the LHC last year. What is the Higgs field? What's the Higgs mechanism? So the Higgs field is a concept which would pervade throughout the whole universe, and it's a framework which would give mass to elementary particles. So certain particles would interact with this Higgs field and acquire mass, and certain other particles would interact with the Higgs field in a different way and not acquire mass. And there's a very nice analogy of how this might work in more lay terms. So imagine we have a crowded room of people, and the crowded room of people represents the Higgs field going throughout of all of space. And when a celebrity walks through this crowded room, the celebrity is going to find it difficult to move through because they'll be surrounded by reporters and cameramen and people who want to meet them, and they'll find it difficult to propagate. On the other hand, a person who's not a celebrity will stream through this crowded room without any problem, and that would be like a massless particle going through the Higgs field. And indeed, speaking at a press conference on the day of the announcements, uh, Emeritus Professor Tom Kibble put that analogy in his own inimitable way. You have a lot of people milling about in a room, journalists probably, Um, (laughs) Margaret Thatcher walks into the room and the result is a sort of crowd around her and this has the effect of adding mass in effect to Margaret Thatcher as she's walking through and she comes out the other side with just as much energy as she went in but on the way she has some mass now with Higgs field of course this fills the whole universe So we have to have a whole universe full of journalists. (laughs) (laughs) So Tom Kibble there. Any thoughts as to why Tom Kibble himself was not listed as a Nobel Prize winner for this? I think the Nobel Committee must have thought long and hard about this, and they decided they wanted to award the prize for the work that was done in 1964. And then there was a problem because of the the six people who did that work. Five were uh, still alive today. And uh, the Nobel Prize has this structure where they award just a maximum uh, of of three prizes. So uh, they must have come to the conclusion after a lot of deliberation that it was appropriate to give the award to the first two papers that appeared in 1964, which was the one that Francois Anglais uh, wrote and then followed by Peter Higgs. And as for the wider significance of the discovery, well, uh, to gender, Jim Verdi was also at that press conference, Professor of Physics here, of course, at Imperial. Uh, Jim really put things into context. I think Tom is a very modest person. He wrote this paper in 1967, which is uh, also a very seminal paper. It's in this paper that he really started making the connections to what the real world looks like, where the photon remains massless and W bos- and Z bosons get a high mass. But also, you have to remember, at the time, quarks had not been discovered. So it wasn't clear where it, these kind of ideas would be applied. And so the quarks were discovered in the later part of the 60s. 
and then the evidence for this extra particle that was predicted by electroweak unification, which is the Z boson, a heavier version of the photon, in fact, uh, because it's neutral. And the last experiment that I worked on, we discovered the W and Z bosons. And that point, this is 1983 now, it's at that point when the first ideas of the LHC started, the year after, there was a big meeting. Because uh, the finally, the missing piece looked like to be the Higgs boson. So that's when the experimentalists had to really pay attention that you've got to go look for this boson. To Jim, De Jim Verdi, so finally, Jerome, your thoughts on the wider significance of all this? Well, I, I think one thing that's worth emphasizing is that this really is a great chapter in scientific discovery. But like all great discoveries in science, while one door is closed, one chapter is closed, they almost invariably open up brand new vistas for further investigation and study. And I think that's precisely the status and the current setting of particle physics today. So we have this beautiful construct, the standard model of particle physics. We have the Higgs boson, which was the last missing link in that story. But we know that there's many new areas to further investigate. For example, one of the ideas is that there is a new symmetry waiting to be discovered around the corner called supersymmetry, and there's many theoretical reasons why this is an attractive idea. And if supersymmetry is there, then there's going to be a whole host of new elementary particles that will be discovered in the coming years. We might also find evidence for extra dimensions, extra spatial dimensions, in addition to the three spatial dimensions that we observe. And we also might find evidence for or understand what dark matter is. Dark matter is, through various cosmological observations, is known to make up about 25% of the mass of the universe. And there's very strong indications that the secret to this dark matter might be found in the next generation of particle accelerators. And I think all these ideas are building towards the new chapter of discovery within particle physics, and hopefully they'll ultimately provide clues to the biggest open question in fundamental physics, which is how to unify or combine the standard model of particle physics with our theory, or Einstein's theory, of gravity, general relativity. And this would provide a unification of all of the known forces in the universe. So I think that's where theoretical physics is poised. We have this beautiful celebration of a great chapter of physics lasting 50 years, but for sure I think we're on the threshold of a brand new and exciting set of developments. And more Nobel Prizes, I'm sure. I hope so. <laughs> indeed. All right, well, Jerome Gorton, thanks very much indeed. Thank you. So that was physics, but of course we have also in these last few weeks seen the awarding of the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. And for comment on that, we have Dr Ian Gould, who's Reader in Computational Chemical Biology here in the Chemistry Department. And Ian, you might think that the Physics Prize and Chemistry Prize are very separate, but in this case there is a kind of relationship between them, isn't there? Yes, there is. I mean, essentially the award for the Chemistry Prize is for the hybridization of quantum mechanics with molecular mechanics. So essentially the problem when you try to deal with large complex chemical systems is that you cannot apply quantum chemistry to those systems because they're far too large. So therefore the chemistry that you're really interested in usually is chemical reactivity where bonds break and bonds form. And so you need a quantum description to actually model those processes. But if you're trying to look at something like an enzyme where you may have of the order of 10 or maybe 20,000 atoms to try and model, it's just totally impractical to use quantum chemistry to do the complete description of that system. So what Warshall, Levitt and Karplus essentially got the award for was a method where they could combine a less sophisticated model to represent the environment and then they had the ability to model using quantum mechanics the actual active site of a protein. Have they already fed into applications in what people like me might see as the kind of real world? Well, the real world is, is obviously the obvious place is the pharmaceutical industry. So the pharmaceutical industry are very keen to understand how a molecule interacts with a enzyme or, say, DNA, where you know how good it is in terms of being able to predict the behaviour of a particular molecule and what happens if you modify that molecule. So the tools that Karplus and Levitt and Warshall have developed and other people in the field are actively used in the agrochemical industry, are used in the pharmaceutical industry and also used in the materials industry as well. All these tools that they've developed which are equally applicable to 
biological molecules are applicable to the solid state. What always astonishes me when you hear about any of these awards is the, the interconnectedness of the communities they come from. You know, people read the headlines, but we often don't understand the social and academic relationships between these people. Well, that's certainly true. I mean, taking Martin Karpler as an example, he was a graduate student for Linus Pauling, who got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his understanding of how the chemical bond worked. And so Martin Karplis's group over the last 50, 60 years almost has been really instrumental in pushing the boundaries and applying the techniques of computational chemistry in very different arenas, particularly in places such as the molecular biology arena, where when you need to solve a crystal structure of a protein, most crystallographers today will be using a program which is a development of the work that has occurred in Martin Karplis's group at Harvard. And to no s small extent, the huge influence of Cambridge and the LMB is also at play here because... Right, and sorry, LMB, just for the listeners. The Laboratory for Molecular Biology, which was set up primarily by Kendrick and Perutz and Klug, really was, pardon the pun, a catalyst for all of this because Michael Levitt was a graduate student at the LMB and he was sent very early on to work with Schneer Lifson and Ari Walshaw was a student of, uh, of Schneer Lifson's and Martin Karpler's had a, a very influential sabbatical in, in, in Cambridge at the LMB at the time. So all three of them happened to be in the same place at the same time. And so that really did, you know, formulate what was going on in that sort of early quantum mechanical, molecular mechanical environment. And so Ari Walshaw then moved to be a postdoc with, with Martin Karpler's at, at Harvard. And, it, it, you know, the, the large number of people, both U.S. and U, in, in Europe, who've passed through Martin Karps's group is enormous. If you look at the genealogy of where a large number of computational chemists come from, it, you can say most of them at some point were at Harvard and moved through Martin Karps's group. Obviously, the awarding of the Physics Nobel Prize, no great surprise for the Higgs boson. How about this chemistry prize as well? Was this always going to happen? I think it's a realisation in the last 20 years that the advance in computer technology, and that's certainly all of computational chemistry has gone hand in glove with the basic development of parallel computers through to today's GPU technology, which essentially means that you have the power to do calculations that weren't even contemplatable 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago. The underlying theory and development of that theory has, has existed for now 40 years. It has only been with a rapid improvement of computational resources that enable you to actually implement and do practical calculations on a timescale that is relevant to people who do experiments. So an analogy, a good friend of mine who's uh, in a large pharmaceutical company has always said, the, you know, you have to be able to simulate your system as fast as we can make it. And that's certainly true if you're trying to mimic, you know, pharmaceutically important molecules, medically relevant chemicals. You have to be able to do it fast enough that you can get an answer in a time frame, which is of relevance to people doing real experiments. Ian Gould speaking to me earlier. So I'm back in the studio now speaking to Anita Hall, who's a senior teaching fellow in the Faculty of Life Sciences, and you have a, a neuroscience background as well, Anita. We are here to talk about the Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology. So what should we know about this year's prize? Oh, yes. Well, it was well-deserved. It was awarded to a triplet of male scientists who've worked out how the incredibly complicated busy interior of the cell is organised and how you move all the proteins you need in various places from their site of origin to their targets and perhaps even outside the cell in the case of things like hormones or in the nervous system if you want to communicate between two nerve cells. And I suppose what this Nobel Prize reflects is just how complex cells are. And I immediately think of my textbook images of a cell almost like a blob. And now, of course, thanks to research like this, we understand the cell as being more like a quite a complex machine. Absolutely, yes. Textbook images are, can be quite misleading. They, they hide the dynamism of a cell. And actually an analogy I found quite useful was that the top of the cell membrane is rather like a simmering soup, bubbling away constantly. And that's the same throughout the cell as well in various membrane-bound compartments within the cell. There's constant activity, proteins and other types of molecules moving all around the cell in various directions in an amazingly coordinated way almost all of the time. 
And this work that's won the Nobel Prize, it focuses specifically on entities called vesicles. What are they? Yes, they're quite simple membranous sacs that the cell can use to carry either membrane proteins or within its interior other proteins that don't need to go in membranes. And they can be tiny or they can be larger, they can fuse with one another and they can move from rather more static compartments to the cell membrane, for example, or to other membranous structures in the cell where their contents are needed. Is this just within the cell or do the vesicles move between cells? Um, That's a good question. It's within cells but the vesicles can also fuse and melt into the cell surface membrane if you like and release their contents outside the cell. So they do by releasing their contents communicate outside the cell as well. Is the Nobel Prize for discovering the vesicles or just getting a more detailed understanding of what they do and this role that they have, transporting enzymes or um, hormones between elements of the cell? Well, there were different aspects of the vesicle transport process that won these prizes. So there was, first of all, how proteins are brought into one of the major protein modification centres of the cell, and then how they are budded off into parts of that membranous compartment to form new vesicles. So that was one of the awardees. He, he, he discovered that process and the proteins that were involved in regulating that. And then those vesicles will then take their newly formed and modified proteins to the next compartment, which happens to be called the Golgi body. And there, the other prize was awarded for understanding how small vesicles can move. And then another aspect of the prize-winning work was studying how these vesicles, particularly in nerve cells, they can wait near the cell surface until they receive a signal, in this case calcium, and then that calcium interacts with a protein on their surface and draws the vesicle towards the cell surface where it can fuse and release its neurotransmitter contents, allowing the central nervous system to work, but also quite a key target for certain neurotoxins, so clinically very relevant process. Which brings us right to your field of expertise in neuroscience. So you were talking about neurotransmitters and nerve cells. What are the clinical aspects then? Yes, so as well as being targets for some of these neurotoxins that I mentioned, the release of vesicles at the appropriate time and the appropriate rate allows transmission of information in your nervous system. And this can go from simple reflex actions like withdrawing your hand from a hot plate or it's key to the learning and memory and flexibility that our incredibly complicated brain and even our spinal cord depend on. So without these packages of neurotransmitter information, we can't pass electrical impulses and we can't encode the information that our brain needs to function. And there are also other cell types which will be releasing similar vesicles, which will also play roles that we don't fully understand yet. All right, Anita, thank you very much indeed for that. That is Anita Hall from the Faculty of Life Sciences bringing this special edition to a close. Of course, there's plenty more on the Nobels on our Imperial News website via imperial.ac.uk slash news. You can search that site for much more on Higgs Boson, including a video interview with Tom Kibble. Well, we'll be back to normal in the next edition, so do join me then. But uh, for now, from me, Gareth Mitchell, thanks very much for listening and goodbye. Goodbye.